1987, a man named Wayne Bent broke away from his position as head pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In fact, he walked away from the religion altogether. He started his own church and called it the Lord Our Righteousness Church, and he took 300 ex-Seventh-day Adventist members with him. And at first, life in this new church seemed quaint and simple. But before long, Wayne started showing his darker side. He claimed that God had appeared to him and given him a message. He was the Messiah. He changed his name to Michael Trevesser and brainwashed his followers into blindly trusting every single thing he said. And in 2007, this little known cult would make national news. Michael wasn't the Messiah. He was a sexual predator. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you are new, my name is Summer Sanchez and on this channel we talk about crime cults and heinous history. So if that is something that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you'll never miss an upload. Today we are talking about the Lord Our Righteousness Church, also known as the Strong City Cult. But before we get started, let's briefly talk about today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Trade. Trade is a coffee subscription service that allows you to experience delicious, unique craft coffee in the comfort of your own home. If you follow me on social media, you know how much I love coffee. I'm always sharing photos of my coffee. I recently just discovered coffee stencils and I'm obsessed. And me and my family love trying different coffees. We always try to pick up a bag of local coffee when we travel. There are so many great options out there in the world and Trade gives us the opportunity to try out so many great brands that we've never even heard of. They offer over 450 unique craft coffees and you can give Trade a little bit of information about your preferences and they will pair you with the best coffee for you. We get really excited when we see the red trade bag on our doorstep. We can't wait to open it up and see which coffee trade has matched us with. It's like a little scheduled surprise. And trade is roasted to order, meaning that the coffee is roasted within 48 hours of shipping. So it's still super fresh when it arrives on your doorstep and shipping is free. And their subscription service is super flexible. You can choose how often you want trade deliveries. You can change your preferences anytime you want. You can even cancel anytime with no hassle. I love love trade and if you're a coffee lover like me I know that you will love them too they make experiencing new and unique coffee fun easy and affordable and you can click my link in the description box to get your own trade coffee subscription started and get your first roasted to order bag of coffee for free thanks again to trade for sponsoring this video and for providing me and my family with delicious coffee and now let's jump into the case Wayne Bent was born on May 18th 1941 and he grew up in Riverside California there isn't a lot of information out there about his childhood which I hate especially Especially in these cult cases, I really like to know, you know, what happened before the cult started. But we do know that he did suffer some very traumatic events throughout his childhood. First of all, Wayne lost his mother at a very young age. He and his mother and his older sister were in a really bad car accident when Wayne was only three years old. Wayne and his sister were fine, but his mother died in the car crash. And this was a very traumatizing event for Wayne. He lost one of the most important people in his life, and he was only three. And then just a year after he lost his mother, his father got remarried and ended up having four other children with his new wife, which you can imagine was probably hard for Wayne. He probably felt like his father had just moved on and he probably felt like he had been replaced. And then when Wayne was 14 years old, he claimed that he was abducted and sexually assaulted by a man. And we don't know any more than that. We don't even know this man's name. Then in 1959, after he graduated from high school, Wayne joined the Navy Reserves and he was there for two years before he was honorably discharged. And then once he got out of the Navy, he felt like it was time to settle down. He wanted to find a wife, you know, start a family, and he ended up marrying a woman named Joan Beckley in 1962. They settled down in the town of Poway, California, and they went on to have three children together. They had one son named Jeff, and they had two daughters named Christy and Susan. At around age 25, he started to become really interested in religion. He joined a local Baptist church, and he started reading the Bible front to back. He attended every service he could. He got baptized in the Baptist church. He taught at Sunday school. He just really threw himself like headfirst into this new religion. And then one day Wayne claimed that God started speaking directly to him. He said that God told him that he needed to stop worshiping on Sundays. So Wayne said he decided to leave the Baptist religion since they worshiped on Sundays and he ended up joining the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
The Seventh-day Adventists don't believe in worshiping on Sundays. They believe that worshiping should be done on Saturdays. So a little bit of background on the Seventh-day Adventist religion. It was created as an offshoot of the Millerite movement. And the Millerites were followers of a man named William Miller. And in 1831, William Miller said that the second advent of Jesus Christ would occur in the year of 1843 or 1844. But then in 1844, when the second coming of Christ didn't happen, it led to something known as the Great Disappointment. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was sort of born out of this Millerite movement. And one of the main people who established this religion was a woman named Ellen White. Ellen White went as far as to say that every other church was teaching its congregants lies and that they were coming directly from the devil. And one of the breakaways from the Seventh-day Adventist Church was actually the Branch Davidians, you know, David Koresh, that whole thing. And this religion itself has actually been called a cult because of how rigid and controlling the rules are. So anyways, Wayne threw himself into this new religion, just like he had with the Baptist church. He became completely obsessed with the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs and teachings. He took part in lots of church events. He became a member of their clergy, and he made sure that he and his family followed the rules to the letter. And eventually Wayne's hard work and devotion paid off because in 1974, he landed a position as an associate pastor at a church in Riverside, California, which is where he grew up. And not long after he landed this position, he attended something called an EST course. So the people who attend these courses, they're made to talk about their past, talk about all the terrible things that they've done, all of their bad traits, their bad habits, basically everything bad about themselves. They're made to, you know, tell everyone that's at this course. And then the trainers, the people who are conducting the course, they then berate the people, they break them down, they make them feel like absolute garbage about their past. And this is supposed to somehow build them up to be a better person. Now this S training is very controversial. Some people come out of this training saying that they feel totally liberated, they feel free, but a lot of people on the outside looking in believe that this is nothing but a very effective form of brainwashing. It sounds a lot like the impact training, which we discussed in the Children of Thunder cult video. Maybe these seminars are related somehow. Deeper level of awareness of who I truly am and what I have in me already it's already there you essentially just get put down you get berated you get yelled at and you're just made to feel really small and insignificant and just like you're a horrible person and it's supposed to in the end have this really profound impact on you and it's supposed to make you ultimately become who you really want to be so wayne comes out of the s training and he's a totally different person and he started to incorporate some of what he had learned from the training into his sermons at his church And eventually he started to drive a wedge between himself and some of the people in his life. And this includes his wife, Joan. Some people who have relatives who have went through this S training say that it completely ruined their relationships with their loved ones. The person who went through the training came out so different and there was just like a wall there that they couldn't break through. I've had problems with S coming between me and people I know that have been through the training. It creates a wall. There is a sort of secrecy. They can't communicate it. You're supposed to accept it on faith. It's just terrific, and that's, you know, sort of all they can tell about, and I have a problem with that. I don't think the graduates want you to accept anything about Est on faith. I think that what they want to ask you to do is to find out for yourself. And this is probably what happened between Joan and Wayne. His fanatically religious beliefs coupled with his newfound enlightenment from this S training, it likely fundamentally changed Wayne as a person and it eventually drove a wedge between them. And eventually in 1981, Joan filed for divorce and she took the kids with her. And Wayne, to explain this, just told everyone that Joan wasn't as devoted to God as he was, her heart wasn't fully in it, and that's why they split. Wayne is now alone but that's okay because now he has more time to devote to his religion and to his congregation and he threw himself even more into the church. In 1982, he was promoted to head pastor of the church, so he was steadily moving up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But it was all about to come crashing down for Wayne when he decided to develop his own training seminar that was very similar to S training. He used the same tactics, you know, tearing down self-esteem, putting everyone's issues on 
on blast in front of everyone, humiliation, degradation. It was just like Wayne's own form of S training, except he also incorporated scripture into his training. I guess he had to make it relevant to the church if he was conducting this in the church. So he started mixing scripture into his training. And Wayne's program became so popular among the Seventh-day Adventists that he was asked to travel all around the country to go to other churches to show them how the program worked. He even made it a requirement when he was interviewing potential new members of the clergy. He would literally berate them, force them to confess all of their sins and stuff before he would even consider them for the position. He would also challenge them to like a Bible battle and he would ask them like, you know, what do you think about this scripture? What do you think it means? And if they didn't answer exactly the way Wayne thought they should, the way that he would interpret it, then they were just dead wrong. And he would mock them and just really make them feel like absolute shit about themselves. And then just when that person thought that they weren't worthy of even stepping foot into Wayne's church, he would then flip and he would play the role of the nice understanding friend who could guide them to the right way of thinking, to his way of thinking. And the person would be so thankful for Wayne's understanding and acceptance that they would do whatever they could to make him happy. And at that point, he would have total emotional control over them. And as time went on, Wayne was teaching his own version of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. They had laid the foundation and now he was putting his twist on everything. He started teaching a very literal interpretation of the Bible. Like whatever was in the Bible, that was it. That's what happened exactly that way. And a lot of the stuff that Wayne was teaching was based on what Ellen White taught back in the 18th hundreds. And a lot of the Seventh-day Adventists came to look at Ellen White as a prophet. And so Wayne started to push the idea that he was this century's version of Ellen White. And then things really started to splinter for Wayne in the church when he started accusing the church elders of teaching the wrong interpretation of the Bible. He was literally calling them out for not teaching it the way he would teach it. So the church elders started to see what was going on. They could see through Wayne Bent and they knew that he was trying to get people on his side. And the elders were probably probably worried that he would become so influential that he could potentially take over the church, or at the very least, he could take a big portion of the existing members with him and create his own offshoot of the religion. And if that thought did cross their minds, then they were at least partially right, because in 1987, Wayne did leave the Seventh-day Adventist church. After he left, he called up several of his congregants and told them what was happening, and that he alone held the true answers and the true interpretation of the Bible. So Wayne and about 300 followers, ex members members of the Seventh-day Adventist church, they started their new church and it was called the Lord Our Righteousness. And Wayne even went on record and called the Seventh-day Adventist church one of the daughters of the great harlot. So yeah, he hated them now. And not long after the split from the Seventh-day Adventists, he organized a retreat on some property that one of his most loyal followers owned in Redding, California. This man's name was David Mead and he offered up his property to Wayne so that he could, you know, do this retreat. It was like this big open campground area and Wayne told his followers that everyone was to meet there at sunrise. And if everyone wasn't there by sunrise, they would die. And so sure enough, come sunrise, all 300 members were there at the campground and Wayne started giving this big, powerful sermon. And then after the sermon, Wayne informed everyone that they were going to be baptized right there on the spot in a nearby creek on the property. It was called Hat Creek. And so one by one, the followers walked out into the water with Wayne. They crossed their arms over their chests and then Wayne dunked their heads backwards into the water and they were now baptized into Wayne's twisted religion. Now keep in mind that these 300 people had already been through Wayne's life support training. So they had already been broken down. They had already been told that they were worthless, that they didn't deserve to be loved. They didn't deserve to be loved by God. And then Wayne himself had been the one to build them back up and mold them into the people that he wanted them to be. So they were already being brainwashed by Wayne before they even left the Seventh-day Adventist church. But what made everything even more believable was that a storm rolled in right as Wayne had began giving that sermon. The storm was raging and Wayne just continued to give this really powerful speech and they believed that this was a sign from God that they were a part of something really amazing. And then once the baptisms began, the rain stopped. So they really read into this and they thought that this was more proof that Wayne had a direct line to God and that they were doing the right thing. And one point that Wayne really made to his followers was that they were all sinless. He told them that he had delivered them from their sins and that they no longer had to feel guilt or shame. They could live their lives guilt-free and totally shameless. And to test how his followers were taking to this idea of being shameless, in 1988, Wayne held a meeting and had some of his followers come up to the front of the church 
and slowly strip off their clothes. And he told them that they needed to get completely naked in front of everyone. And he waited until they got down to their underwear and they were just about to take those off too when he stopped them and told them that they had passed the test. But there were some people who didn't feel comfortable stripping in front of 300 people, understandably. And those people had proven to Wayne that they weren't living a totally shameless life and they were kicked out of the church. Wayne lost a lot of members over the years, but most of them didn't leave because they wanted to. A lot of them left because they were forced out by Wayne. He demanded that the members be totally loyal to him and not question any of his teachings. So if he thought that one of his followers was doubting him, that's it. They were out. Some people did leave on their own though, and that really started happening more and more when Wayne started taking too many liberties with his interpretation of the Bible. If something didn't fit his idea of what he wanted his church to be, he would literally tell his followers to just omit that part of the Bible. Don't pay attention to that part, which is crazy when you think back to how he ran his church when he was the pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist religion. He was teaching a very literal interpretation of the Bible. So this caused a lot of families to leave Wayne's church. They didn't like this sudden change and they started waking up to the fact that Wayne Bent wasn't a prophet. He was just a fake. And one of those people that broke away from the Lord Our Righteousness Church was David Mead. Remember, David Mead is the guy that owned that land in Reading where that mass baptism was held. David had quickly become one of Wayne's closest friends and most loyal followers, and he moved up the ranks in the church. But once Wayne started to shift his teachings, David challenged him and they had a huge fight and David ended up leaving the church. Wayne owned a 300 acre ranch near the town of Sandpoint, Idaho. So after he had this falling out with David Mead, he and about 70 of his most loyal followers left California and moved to the ranch. And one of those 70 followers was Wayne's son, Jeff. Over the years, Jeff had reconnected with his father and he really took to his teachings and Jeff totally devoted himself to Wayne's new church. And you will see later just how devoted Jeff is to his dad. So once the church made the move to Idaho, they started living together on like a compound. A lot of the members sold off their possessions before the move and they gave the money to the church and they lived a vegetarian life. They grew their own food. The women grew their hair really long. They didn't wear jewelry or makeup. The men had beards. So they just lived this quiet, quaint little life in Idaho. In 1996, Wayne started his own website called thewinds.org. And on this website, Wayne wrote about his church, his beliefs, and some weird conspiracy theories. And that website is still up. So you can go check it out if you want to. I'll leave that in the description box. Wayne also wrote a few books and I tried to get my hands on one of these books. Two of them were out of print. There was one available on Amazon, but it was $300. But essentially the purpose of these books and the website was to try to draw in new members. Wayne really wanted to get his word out and bring in more followers, but these efforts did not pay off. They didn't really attract any new members. Now around this time, Time, another cult was making headlines and that was the Heaven's Gate cult. And if you don't know about the Heaven's Gate cult, they were a small group of people led by a man named Marshall Applewhite. And in 1997, all of the members committed suicide together in the home that they shared. I have actually covered the Heaven's Gate cult and I'll link that in the description if you want to learn more about them. But when Heaven's Gate made global news for committing mass suicide, it really put a spotlight on cults and the potential risks of being involved in a cult. And so the people of Sandpoint, Idaho started to compare the Heaven's Gate cult to the strange people that they saw living on the commune calling themselves the Lord Our Righteousness Church. Some of the locals really wanted them out of their town. They started vandalizing the property, just, you know, saying really hateful things to the members. And eventually it just got to be too much. And Wayne decided that it was time to leave Idaho. Sandpoint was not a big city at all. The population was only about 5,000, but Wayne wanted to move somewhere even more remote, somewhere that, you know, there were no nosy neighbors, somewhere he he could do whatever he wanted and not attract the attention of city officials. And so in the year 2000, he and his followers made the move to the New Mexico desert and they settled in an area called Traveser Creek. And this place was super remote. The population of Traveser Creek was less than 200. And Wayne named their new compound Strong City. And his new mission was to keep corruption and outside influence out of Strong City. Wayne told his followers that if they stayed in Strong City, they would be free of the evil 
evils of the outside world. He wanted them to come to see Strong City as a haven and the outside world as evil. He wanted his followers to never ever leave. At first they lived on the property out of RVs, but eventually they did put trailers on the property. They also worked together to install plumbing. They grew their own food. They became this little self-sustaining community. Wayne told the parents of the children in the cult that they couldn't enroll their kids in school. So they were to be homeschooled there at Strong City. And I'm honestly not really sure how much education any of those kids got when they were living in the cult. And now that Wayne had his followers totally isolated, it was time to declare himself the Messiah. So in June of 2000, just a few months after the cult moved to New Mexico, Wayne claimed that he received a message from God. He said that he was just sitting in his living room one night. He was just hanging out when suddenly he heard the voice of God say that he was the Messiah. And he told him that the world was going to end on October 31st, 2007. Then Wayne claimed that the spirit of the archangel Michael appeared and came into his body. Of course, this just made the followers devote themselves to Wayne even more. And they started to prepare for the end of the world. Wayne changed his name after this. He was now known as Michael Trevesser, Michael after the archangel Michael and Trevesser after the area of New Mexico where Strong City was located. Now, like I said, the kids didn't get to attend school because Wayne didn't want any outside influence potentially messing up this thing he had going on. And the followers were also not allowed to watch, you know, anything that could have any kind of outside influence on them. They may not have even had a TV at all. I'm not really sure about that, but they did have limited internet access. They mostly just visited Wayne's website, the Wynn's website, and they would check out whatever new thing Wayne had posted that day. He would post things about his thoughts, his feelings, his interpretations of the Bible. And the way he did this was basically like a blog. So most days he would make some sort of entry on the website and his followers would be checking for anything new. They would be checking just every single day to see what new thing Wayne had said. And one day, right before he announced that he was in fact the Messiah, Wayne made an entry on the Wynn's website about giving yourself wholly to God. And he added in some stuff about sex outside of the marriage being okay if it's with God's conduit. So right after he made that post, he announced that he was the Messiah. So the women in the group started to take a closer look at that blog entry, giving yourself wholly to God. Sex is okay as long as it's with God's conduit. And they started to believe that they needed to enter into a sexual relationship with Wayne in order to be closer to God. So Wayne began having regular sex with at least two women in the cult that were already married. He really really thought this thing through. He had brainwashed these people into believing everything he said and to take things literally. So he knew exactly what he was doing when he made that blog post. He knew that the women in the cult would interpret that exactly the way he wanted them to. He knew that they would eventually come to him and ask to have sex with him. Wayne never had to approach any of the women for sex. He never had to scare them into it. He never had to threaten them. They would come to him because he had so carefully brainwashed and manipulated them into thinking that it was actually their idea. So when the husbands inevitably got upset about their wives having sex with Wayne, Wayne would just blame it on God's will. He would even be the husband's shoulder to cry on. How messed up is that? So the women would come to Wayne, tell him that they believe God is telling them to have sex with him. Wayne would then pause and think for a second, you know, acting like he's listening for God's instructions. Then he'd be like, yeah, God said that he does want us to have sex. Or he would call it consummation. God just told me that he wants us to consummate. And then the husband's would find out because this was not a secret. This was well known to everyone in the cult that this was happening on a regular basis. The husbands would of course be super sad and hurt, but they would ultimately accept that it was God's will. And then Wayne Bent would go to the husbands and counsel them through this very tough time in their lives. Wayne would even say things like, I can't believe that God wants me to do this. I'm just as shocked as you are. I don't understand why this is happening. So like I said, two of the women in the cult became Wayne's regular sexual partners. And eventually he started calling them his witnesses. Witnesses. That is how he referred to them. Certainly by no instruction from me, two witnesses, these two, uh, left their homes, left their families, and, and it wasn't at my instruction or behest. It just occurred. 
So these two witnesses were named Kathy and Debbie, and Kathy's husband, Tim, was not happy about the sexual relationship that she was having with Wayne. And he had already been questioning things a bit before this had all happened. So when he found out and confronted Wayne about it, Wayne told him to leave the cult since he had the audacity to question God. And Kathy chose to stay there with Wayne. The other witness, Debbie, had been married to her husband for over 30 years when she started having sex with Wayne Bent. Her husband was interviewed and he was asked asked about how he felt about his wife and the mother of his children openly having sex with another man. And he said that it was heartbreaking, but that Wayne had been his rock to help him work through his feelings. It was a battle between me and God. And it's like Michael was on my side. He said, if you're angry at God, go tell him. Michael was my way through it. Now, even though Debbie's husband did accept the situation and he did stay in the cult, their son, Seth, could not accept it. Once he realized what consummate meant, because that's what he kept hearing was that his mother was consummating with Wayne. Once he realized what that meant, that his mother was having sex with Wayne Bent, he was done. He wanted out. He wrote his mother this really long letter apologizing for what he was about to do. And he left the cult and he moved to Florida with some relatives. And these are just a couple of examples of how Wayne Bent was ruining relationships and destroying marriages. Wayne was sleeping with other women in the cult as well. So this was happening within other families. And remember, these people were conditioned to not feel guilt or shame. So the women didn't feel like they had done anything wrong either. This was simply a show of their love and devotion to God and their Messiah, Wayne Bent. And this sexual manipulation was not off limits to any of the women in the cult, including Wayne's own family members. Jeff Bent's own wife, Christiana, also had the calling to go have sex with Wayne, her father-in-law. Wayne wasn't even above manipulating and taking advantage of his own son's wife. And Jeff had been so loyal to Wayne. He literally did anything and everything Wayne asked of him. And one night, Jeff's wife, Christiana, just felt the need to go to Wayne and ask if it was God's will that he and she consummate. And of course, Wayne said God told him that, yes, it was his will. And they didn't do this just one time. They had sex multiple times over and over again on several occasions. There was a BBC documentary that was done on this cult, on the Strong City cult. It's probably the best source of information about this cult. And Wayne actually allowed the documentary crew to interview him and his followers over the course of like three weeks. And there is some extremely hard to watch footage of Wayne trying to explain why he and his daughter-in-law had sex multiple times. It's so uncomfortable to watch, but you guys need to see it because I cannot explain to you how awkward this is. God came down on Michael and forced him to consummate with Christiana. I mean, it was a terrible, strange act of God. He did a an astonishing thing that uh, I was astonished and so was Michael. Um, I stood up like this and um, and suddenly I was forced down on the floor and I had to get down, I was down just about like this and I was in pain and all I could do was groan. All I could do was kind of rock. And I, I started seeing that the consummation with Christiana was imminent and I was going to be, um, I was going to have to do that. I was just laying awake and I was thinking about um, coming over here. And I said to Father, I said, when I go over there, if Michael invites me in, I will ask for the consummation tonight. So was it just a single occasion, this literal physical consummation? No, it wasn't. But you, you consummated more than once? Yes, yes. yes. Why is it necessary to consummate more than once? Could you not answer that question yourself? When you marry a wife, 
Do you consummate only once? And I really feel bad for Jeff throughout this interview because you can see how hurt he is. And this is what I meant earlier about Jeff remaining totally loyal to his dad. At the point where you know your dad is having sex with your wife and you have to just be cool with it, because if you have a problem with it, then that means you have a problem with God. It's like you can't have feelings because if you do, then you're not as faithful to God as you should be. It's just completely messed up. It's total manipulation. So, so far the victims of Wayne's sexual manipulation have been women, women who are above the age of consent. So even though this is really toxic and really horrible and manipulative, technically Wayne hasn't done anything illegal, but that was all about to change. In 2006, Wayne yet again took to his website and posted another cryptic blog entry. This time he wrote that to be closer to God, you needed to be naked before God. Being naked before God would bring you resolution in your life. And again, the followers read this and interpreted it in the most literal sense, just like Wayne wanted them to interpret it. And so they all started to have this realization that they needed to get naked in front of their Messiah, Wayne Bent. And among the people who came to this conclusion were several underage teenage girls. One of the girls wasn't even a teenager. She was only 12 years old. So the first girl who approached Wayne about getting naked with him was a girl named Esther. She went to Wayne Bent's trailer. She told him that God was giving her this strong urge to be naked with him. And so Wayne paused and he thought, you know, he was pretending like he was listening for God's instructions. And then he said, God says that it is his will that you get naked with me. So Wayne led her to his bedroom. She stripped down completely naked. She got into his bed. Wayne also got completely naked. And then he laid down in the bed right next to her. They talked and prayed. He even held her skin to skin in the bed. And she came out of that experience feeling like a whole new world had opened up to her, like she was seeing things more clearly. But Wayne had just crossed a line because Esther was only 16 years old. Another girl did the exact same thing the next night and her experience was pretty much the same as Esther's. God came down on them and told them to do it. Why naked? Nakedness is another symbol of our relationship with God. I treated them with the same respect as if I'd been a physician who was doing surgery. Uh, you know, MDs are with naked people. MDs even put their fingers in women's sexual parts and they call it pap smears or whatever else they do. You don't think there's a distinction between a doctor and yourself? I would say no. I would have more authority to touch the soul than a MD would. MDs aren't prepared for what I've had to do. An MD is far more likely to think of sex when he's doing something to a woman in her private parts than I am. And after this second girl came to him and was naked with him, Wayne announced to the cult that God told him to collect seven virgins and to have a ceremony in the desert. So he gathered up seven virgins. One of the virgins was only 12 years old. They dressed in white robes and they went out into the desert and held this weird ceremony. And after that, Wayne had sex with most of the virgins. He claims he did not have sex with the underage girls. I personally think that Wayne knew that he would be in major legal trouble if anyone found out that he had actually slept with the minors. Some of the parents were already you know, kind of looking at Wayne differently after he announced the little virgin ceremony. So he knew that this would be too risky, but that did not stop him from letting each of the minors strip down naked in front of him. One by one, each of the underage girls went to Wayne Ben's house, asked if she could get naked in front of him. He would always pause and wait for God's instructions. God always said yes. The girls would then strip down, get into his bed. And in most cases, Wayne would also strip down naked and get into bed with the girls. Some of the girls were even kissed by Wayne and one girl said that she was kissed on her breasts. And just keep in mind that this cult has been going on since 1987 and it is now 2006. So these minors had been born into this cult. Wayne had known these girls since they were little babies. So all of this is going on right before the world was supposedly about to end. Remember that prophecy that the world was gonna end on October 31st at midnight, 2007. And so some of the ex-members still had family members in the cult that were still living in Strong City and they started to get worried that the cult would commit mass suicide. The ex-members had woken up and realized that Wayne was not actually the Messiah and they knew that the end of the world wasn't gonna happen on October 31st, 2007. But they also knew that Wayne had a very tight grip over his people and that if he even hinted 
that they should all commit suicide, the members would do it. So some of the parents went to the authorities with their concerns. And so some of the underage kids were removed from Strong City. And these families really hoped that they would get their children out from under Wayne's watchful eye, away from his teachings. And they thought that they could get through to them and make them see that Wayne was a fraud. But that's not what happened. Many of the minors went on hunger strikes as soon as they were removed from Strong City. They refused to listen to anything their families had to say about Wayne or the cults. And they swore that if they weren't allowed to go back to Strong City, they would starve themselves to death. And so many of the teens returned to Strong City. Some of them even convinced their parents to sign over their parental rights to family members who were still in the cult. And when October 31st, 2007 finally came and the world did not end, Wayne managed to convince everyone that he never actually meant that the world was going to end like literally. It was more of a spiritual thing. That BBC film crew was actually in the area at the time that the world was supposed to end, but they were not permitted on the property. Wayne told them that they weren't allowed to be there. But the film crew parked right in front of the compound that night and right at midnight, a loud siren went off at the compound and all of the members came outside with flashlights and they were yelling liberty and like cheering and stuff. And that was it. They just turned around and went back inside. <laughs> It was the most bizarre, lamest, most anticlimactic apocalypse ever, and it was all caught on video. Now, Wayne didn't know it yet, but the police had taken an interest in the Strong City cult. Stories were starting to come out about Wayne being naked with underage girls, one of them only 12 years old. Ex-members who had recently escaped the cult were taking to the internet, and they were coming forward with their stories of sexual manipulation at the hands of Wayne Bent. Two of the girls who had been naked with him were actually sisters. One was 14 at the time, and one was 16. They were Lakeisha and Ashley Sayer. And when their parents, John and Elsa Sayer, found out what had taken place between their daughters and Wayne Bent, they were done with the cult. They left and they took Ashley with them, but Lakeisha refused to leave. She was just so obsessed and brainwashed and she couldn't bear the thought of leaving Wayne or the cult. It was her entire life. So Elsa and John left Lakeisha there, but they eventually did go to the authorities and they had her forcibly removed from Strong City. And listening to Lakeisha talk about her experience experience lying naked with Wayne. She felt like it brought her closer to God and she couldn't have been more pleased with the entire experience. But Lakeisha's sister Ashley had a totally different experience. Ashley was the girl who said Wayne had kissed her breast when they were lying naked together and she was totally traumatized by the whole thing. Her parents had went to authorities. They told them everything that had happened with their daughters and Wayne Bent. And it also came out that Wayne had asked the girl's father permission to have sex with his daughters. Wayne told John Sayer that it was God's will that he slept with his 14 and 16 year old daughters. John Sayer did say no, thankfully, because if he would have said yes, there's no doubt in my mind that Wayne would have sexually abused those girls even further. So in April of 2008, three of the minor girls were removed from the compound and charges were brought against Wayne Bent for three counts of criminal sexual contact with a minor and three counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. After he was arrested, Wayne was quoted saying, Jesus had not committed any crimes, so the authorities had to invent some crimes to crucify him over. It's the same for me also. I have committed no crimes, but many crimes are being imagined and concocted in the minds of men to try to kill me again. The trial began on December 8th, 2008, and some of the underage girls did testify about the day that they laid naked with Wayne Bent. Lakeisha Sayer gave her testimony and she cried on the stand and she said that she loved Wayne very much and that she wanted to return to Strong City, still very much brainwashed by Wayne. But her sister Ashley's testimony was much different. She was angry at Wayne. She finally realized how he had manipulated her and taken advantage of her. There were also a couple of psychologists that testified both for the defense and the prosecution. And one of them noted that it was hard for her to get a good background on the girls because they had no medical records. They had never been seen by a doctor. And there were no school records either because they had not been schooled in the public school system. They had been homeschooled in Strong City. And Wayne Bent even got on the stand and tried to defend his actions by saying that the girls wanted to get naked with him. He'd never told them to do that. It was all their idea. And the prosecutor was like, 
you didn't think to tell these miners no when they asked you if they could lay naked with you in your bed? And he said, no, I really try to stay away from telling people what to do. In the end, Wayne was found guilty on all charges except for one count of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. He was sentenced to 18 years in prison with eight of those years suspended. And you would think or hope that the cult would disband once Wayne was put into prison, but no. There were only about 40 or so members left, but they all returned to Strong City to wait for Wayne's release. Wayne was released early in 2016 when he was diagnosed with skin cancer. And as far as I know, Wayne Bent is still alive and living in Strong City with the remaining members of his cult to this day. And that was the case of the Strong City cult. Please let me know what you guys think about this one down in the comments. This one isn't really covered at all, so most of you have probably never heard of it, but let me know in the comments if you have heard of this cult. Don't forget to check out my link in the description box to get your trade subscription started and you'll get your first bag of coffee totally free. And if you find this type of content interesting, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. I have so much content planned for the coming months. Please like this video and leave a comment. It really helps to push this video out to more viewers and that is the easiest way for you to support me and my channel. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching and I will see you next time. Thank you.